presenter is Richard Antill. Richard is currently a risk manager for the LPLC and previously was a member of this bar. And so Richard also, like our previous speaker Michael McGarvey, has a wealth of experience to bring to his role as a risk manager with the LPLC. In that area, Richard assists solicitors and barristers as well in managing the risk of practice, deals with the insureds, reviewing and analysing data, helping delivering an education program, which is what he's doing here this morning for us, um, and involved with academics, consultants, to bring it all together so to have the best quality of risk management for the profession um, as the profession's insurer. Richard's topic this morning, as you can see, is common themes in claims arising from commercial litigation. Please welcome Richard Antill. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, I actually only uh, joined the LPLC last September, and as, as Michael said, before that I was at the bar, I was on Michael's list, uh, and I practised in solicitor-client disputes. Um, so, and, and I didn't really have a theoretical, any sort of really background in risk management, um, and so I went, when, uh, since joining the LPLC, I've had to really get up to speed in risk management. Um, so before I get on to common themes in commercial litigation, and I, I only have half an hour, so I'll have to be quick, I just wanted to um, touch on some of sort of the, the, the very basic risk management theory, if, if you haven't come across that before. The, the seminal, in Australia, the seminal publication uh, in risk management for lawyers is a report that was written in the 1990s called the Streeton Report, uh, and it was the first time it was done where uh, someone, a, a group of people, consultants, looked through claims, uh, and I think it was based in New South Wales, in, in law covers data. They looked through claims, and instead of just looking at claims, well, is this a, a litigation matter? Is it a family law matter? Is it, uh, instead of looking at you know, claims in terms of practice area, they looked through claims and, and tried to identify whether there are any common themes across claims, um, uh, across practice area in relation to claims. And uh, I'll just flick through these. Um, what they came up with was five underlying causes of claims, and I'll just touch on those because I think it's worthwhile, um, even if you've heard this before, being, uh, hearing it again. The first one was attitudes to engagement management, and what that really means is how you deal with the client when the engagement starts, or the, ma the matter commences, uh, how you manage the expectations, um, how you importantly document what you are retained to do and what you're not retained to do. Uh, one of the common claims we get at the LPLC arises out of what the solicitor sees as a limited retainer and they say, well, no, I was retained to do this bit of work. I wasn't retained to advise on tax. I wasn't retained to advise on uh, employee entitlements or something, but, uh, which, which is an example of a limited retainer. And that's fine, but it's important in those circumstances that there be documentary uh, evidence to establish that uh, limited retainer. So ideally in your retainer letter, you should be setting out not only what you are going to do, but any areas where you're not actually acting and where the client needs protection, such as tax, such as uh, w w whatever um, arises in, in the transaction. And make sure that's in writing, because if there's a later dispute, or, or you can imagine if something then later goes wrong with the employee entitlements or the tax issues or the planning issues, the client is inevitably going to go back and point to the solicitor and say, you should have protected me on that. Um, so that's, that's a very important thing to be aware of in engagement management. It's, and, and I should say on that, it's not only at the start of the retainer, it actually, it's important to think of that all through the retainer. And, and if there are any circumstances that change or any uh, new situations that arise where you need to manage those expectations, um, it's important to do that. The second underlying cause of claims is failure to manage the legal issues. Um, now this can be, in a sense, getting the law wrong or it might be in si simply not understanding the basic factual background and therefore applying the wrong legal principles um, and so forth. Um, the important thing there is, and I think Michael even mentioned it in his, his talk, is it, it, um, we are increasingly in the legal profession specialised. Um, we all, well, most people will, will specialise in some area of law um, and it, it's very difficult to, 
you know, know, know every area of practice. That's, that's, the, that's the bane, in the sense, of the sole practitioner in the suburbs. Um, uh, it's, so it's important if you have a matter where you don't have experience um, to, to acknowledge that and make sure you deal with that. In a sense, don't dabble in areas of practice where you're not experienced because there are so many, so many uh, principles, rules of uh, uh, practice in, in so many areas. Um, it, it's, it's likely if you're practicing in an area, if you, if you dabble in an area that you, you're not aware of uh, or you're not experienced in, there'll be things that you're not even aware that you don't know. Um, so, so be aware of that. Uh, try and stick to your strengths in practice. Third one, failures in listening, asking and explaining, and that's really communication. Um, and that's obviously lawyers need to be good communicators. Um, it's, it's what we do. Um, you need to be able to not only communicate to your client, but also listen to your client and understand where your client is coming from. Uh, there's a couple of um, aphorisms in, in this area, is that people will only uh, remember what they understand. So if you're with a client um, and you uh, explain to them um, all sorts of things and they might nod and think, oh yes, that's good, I'm glad you know all about that because I certainly don't understand it, um, you might get the impression that they understand everything you're saying and therefore they'll remember it. Um, if, if they don't understand it, they, they can't possibly remember it. And so if, if something goes wrong later on, then they'll say, you never told me that. Um, so, so be aware of that. And, and in appropriate situations, it's useful to have the technique where you ask the client to explain things back to you. So you can actually judge uh, how much the client has actually understood. Uh, exposure to simple oversights is another cause of claim. And this can be simply you know, missing a, a, a court date or uh, uh, not, not uh, responding to, or not, not opening an email or something like that. Um, and these things do happen. And, and the important risk management lesson in this area is it on a firm basis, it's important to have um, systems in place, in a sense, fail-safe systems in place, or backup systems in place, so that you can catch these sort of simple oversights. Um, I suppose an analogy would be, if you, if you think of the airline industry, obviously risk management in the airline industry is very sophisticated and they will have, you know, backup systems so that if, if a navigation system goes down, they'll have some other way of, of dealing with it. And, and I think it's a useful thing for firms to think about in, their, in, their, in their, the way the firm practices is to sort of have inbuilt redundancy in their systems or policies and procedures so that simple oversights can be caught. There's some sort of safety net to catch those. And the fifth one is a lack of usable trail. And this is probably the most critical one. Um, what I mean by lack of usable trail, it's really a lack of uh, documentation in writing. So, so not putting advices in writing. You might be advising a client to adopt a certain, in, in your opinion, they should adopt a certain course. Um, they instruct you, no, they, they don't want to accept that advice. It's important at that stage to make sure that that advice is put in writing because, as you can imagine, if, if, the, if, that, if the client adopts that other course and something goes wrong, then they're going to uh, have a tendency to, to, to point the finger later on. So it's important to have that usable trail, not only to avoid claims because if you then put that advice in writing, maybe the client will receive that writing and reflect on it and, and understand your point of view uh, a little better and therefore adjust them their, their conduct so they might they might avoid the claim but even more importantly it makes the claim um, uh, much easier to deal with uh, the LPL if, if a claim comes to the LPLC and there's a, a letter of advice confirming the advice there's file notes then it's 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 an easy uh, claim or notification for the LPLC to deal with and it's quick and cheap and 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 it can be dealt with quickly um, Conversely, if a claim comes to the LPLC or notification and it's, it boils down to um, what occurred in a particular conference, um, was the client told such and such or was the client not told such and such and, and it's simply a word against word, the solicitor swears that he told the, the client that and the client swears that he wasn't, 
when the claim comes to the LPLC, it'll be apparent that it's, it's a case that can't necessarily, th th there's uncertainty as to which way the claim will go, and ultimately it would depend upon how those two uh, witnesses perform in the witness box, how they perform under cross-examination, cr cross and what the judge uh, decides who, who to accept. Um, so there's, there's a lot of risk involved in running that sort of case. Um, and also, unfortunately, solicitors start, if I can put it this way, a little bit behind the eight ball in those sort of disputes because it's very easy for a judge to say, well, you're a solicitor, you're a professional person, you should have taken a file note. And the fact that you haven't taken a file note uh, leads me to the, the inference that this didn't occur or something like that. So, so really, it's important, I can't stress this enough, to, to throughout your practice, um, be aware of the need to create this usable trail. Uh, letters of advice to the clients in writing and file notes. And, and on that, it's, it's really not our concern, um, the LPLC, but, but it does arise because some people sort of, I, I think someone was commenting to me yesterday, we had our risk management intensive yesterday, and someone, uh, one of our panel solicitors was commenting to me that um, he, he comes across solicitors who perhaps have the attitude about risk management that um, it's really not worth the while, you know, from a business point of view, you know, a claim will come along every so often and it's just cheaper to pay off the claim than engage in, in uh, costly risk management. Now, I, I think that's completely wrong and I could probably spend a half an hour as to why that's wrong, but one of the things in, in, on this point of lack of usable trail is that we, I think since the 2004 Act, the Legal Profession 2004 Act came in, we have seen a huge growth in the number of solicitor client disputes on costs and and taxations, solicitor client taxations. And I've been in a solicitor client taxation uh, and, and I know exactly how uh, Associate Justice Wood acts and if you go along to a taxation and you say you've had a three hour conference with the client, uh, you'll be expected to produce a file note. You'll be expected to produce a file note that establishes that it went for three hours, so it's important to put on your file note that it went for three hours. But you'll also be expected to have a file note that has something, some detail as to why it went for three hours. What was the, the, the context of the, the, the conference? Why was it necessary for three hours? Because if you don't, the taxing master will tax that off. You won't get paid for the three hours. So it's important from a business point of view to make sure you get paid that you have this usable trail, these file notes, um, apart from the, the, the claims aspect. Uh, so I, I might just, I think that's probably enough, I've already spent half my time on this and I'll get through to uh, the main points that I wanted to make because, uh, because I imagine uh, most of you solicitors or barristers obviously and, and be practising commercial litigation, I wanted to run through some of the common themes um, in commercial litigation claims. Um, one of my... Um, the task at the LPLC since I joined is to go through uh, a lot of the uh, commercial litigation claims, or in fact all of them, um, to, with a view to updating our booklet. We have various booklets on our website. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at our website. I, before I went to the LPLC, I didn't even know about it, but there's a lot of material on the LPLC website, booklets, bulletins, uh, in check, um, the, the policy itself, I'd encourage you to read the policy. Um, uh, so, but, but, yeah, one of the publications we have is booklets um, and I was given the task of updating the commercial litigation booklet so I've been going through uh, a lot of the commercial litigation claims. The booklet's not ready yet but I'll just talk quickly about some of the common themes that I, I have identified so far in these claims. The first one is client screening um, because often you pick up a, a claim or a notification and you look through it and you think, gee, this was pretty obvious from the start that this this was going to be a difficult client um, and uh, you know really was it the was it appropriate for this solicitor to take on this matter in the first place um, it, I mean solicitors there is no cab rank principle for solicitors um, it is it is um, within your 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 rights to to refuse to take on matters or refuse to take on clients um, large law firms have very sophisticated client screening programs and, and it's worthwhile thinking about that, whether you really want to take on uh, certain clients. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't take on uh, 
clients in certain situations. I, I know that there was an article in the, um, the Law Institute Journal last year that the LPLC did uh, entitled D-rate, D-rated clients, I think it was, uh, talked about sort of the, the, the obvious signs of clients that are going to be problems later on. Um, we copped a bit of flack in relation to that. There was a letter to the Law Institute Journal a couple of months later saying, how dare we say that because they're the people that are, are most in need of protection from practitioners. So we're not really saying, look, don't act for these people or, or don't act for, you know, these D-rated D clients. Um, I suppose, it, but it's important to identify them, uh, identify sort of the clients that could cause trouble later on or that, that are going to uh, need a lot of management and therefore deal with them in an appropriate way throughout the uh, retainer. Um, and, and I suppose just a, a simple example of that is, uh, you know, and it, I was very familiar with it when I was at the bar, if you've got a client coming to see you uh, who is complaining about their previous practitioner, um, who, hasn't, who doesn't want to pay their previous practitioner, who uh, thinks their previous practitioner stuffed up everything under the sun, then, then it's worthwhile um, asking yourself the question um, how you're going to get paid um, and, and whether any sort of claim is going to be made against you in the future. And, and, and really taking, I suppose, extra steps in the risk management area um, to deal with that. Ma manage their expectations. Make sure you, you create that usable trail. Um, the second one, acting without authority. Um, clearly, I mean, there's, there's been recent um, cases publicised. Clearly, um, you need authority from the client to, before you commence litigation in the name of a client. Um, you need uh, authority of the client to settle. Um, and so it's important to have authority of the client um, when, you, when you undertake major steps um, in litigation. Um, thirdly, uh, delay. Uh, that It's obviously uh, often a cause of, of claims and it might be a delay in... Um, Issuing proceedings, it might be a delay in taking a certain step, putting in a defence, or delay in in uh, discovery and so forth. Um, so be aware of that. Be aware of your time frames. Have a diary system, and, and even a, a, a sort of a, a, a firm-wide diary system. So if someone's away, uh, you know, someone else can pick up those those important uh, tasks for the day. Um, Wrong procedure can, can give, give rise to claims and that can be not complying with preconditions. We have in, in various areas of practice there are certain preconditions that you have to undertake before you can issue proceedings or um, so it's important to make sure that your client has complied with those preconditions, um, either the statutory preconditions or the contractual preconditions um, uh, <coughs> before issuing proceedings. Uh, wrong jurisdiction. Um, obviously, there's, there's, we've got a multitude of courts and tribunals. It's important to uh, make sure that where, if you're commencing litigation, you commence it in the correct jurisdiction. Um, advice on prospects. And the, 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 the lesson I learned, actually, in, 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 that I was quite surprised at when I went through the, um, the, the claims data is we get claims um, that, that, obviously, that you know, the solicitor has given two... Um, robust advice about prospects and said, oh, look, it's a, it's a winner, or it, it, perhaps put it another way, haven't advised the client of the risks, and, and that can lead to lend claims if the client um, uh, faces adverse um, consequences later on. But uh, interestingly, we also do get claims where um, the advice has been too conservative, um, uh, a client has been told, no, they don't have any sort of cause of action, um, it's not worth pursuing, uh, and the client goes away, limitation period expires, and uh, the client then goes to see another solicitor who takes a different view about prospects and will bring a claim against the solicitor for the expiry of the limitation period. So <coughs> it's, it's a difficult line to draw sometimes, or it's a different path, difficult path to draw sometimes. Um, you have to be wary of giving advice that's too robust, but you also sometimes have to be wary of giving advice that's too conservative. And perhaps if you're giving advice that, that a client should forget it, you might include there that they're certainly welcome to get a second opinion if they wanted to um, and advise them about limitation periods. Um, next one, client dictating conduct of proceedings. And you'd probably all be aware of the sort of client that I'm talking about, the client who wants uh, to control everything, uh, wants to make all the decisions, 
uh, really uh, perhaps only uses you as a uh, post box, um, send this letter, you know, respond in this way. Um, <clears throat> and and they're different, and then difficult clients because if, if something goes wrong, they'll then uh, have a tendency towards pointing the finger at the solicitor um, without acknowledging the fact that they've actually um, really dictated everything to the solicitor. So you can get overly aggressive cl clients, clients that want to skimp on costs. Um, and look, you know, that's a difficult line to draw. But obviously, if, if your client's skipping on costs, you need to advise the client of the risks of doing that. Um, because if then something later on happens, um, then you'll be covered. Um, and client not following advice. If, you, if you're advising a client to take certain action uh, and they don't want to follow that, then it's important to, as I've already said, put that in writing. Um, another one is risk of insolvent defendants. Um, obviously, litigation is really a two-step process. You get judgment and then you enforce judgment. Um, unfortunately, um, sometimes solicitors don't think about the enforcement of the judgment uh, enough or don't warn their clients about the risks of enforcement of the judgment or the, the fact that there are just at least two steps involved. Um, so, you know, halfway through a litigation, a, d a defendant might go insolvent um, and you've, you've got a problem. So, so be aware of that. Advise your client. Um, perhaps uh, investigate uh, insurance arrangements uh, that, that, that might, um, might help, um, but, but certainly um, be aware of that in litigation. Um, and and the, last, uh, yeah, the last one on this slide is, and I think it's important actually for barristers as well as solicitors, um, it's something that I picked up in going through claims and thought, gee, that is an important issue. And that is making a strategic decision without sufficient client buy-in. It's, it's very easy, um, particularly for barristers and, and probably for solicitors as well, when you're briefing barristers, to have a detailed discussion about all the different courses of action that you could take and the risks and whatnot, and then make a decision between the solicitor and barrister and, and go off and do it. And the client hasn't been told, hasn't really participated in that decision at all. Um, which, is, which can be a problem later on if, if, the, if that decision turns out to be um, the wrong one, uh, the client can then um, make a complaint about that. So it's important, I suppose, in those scenarios to actually take a step back and instead of just having this sort of barrister solicitor high, you know, very intellectual talk about stuff which the client won't necessarily understand, uh, it's important for solicitors to be able to translate that into language that the client can understand um, and, and at least advise them, the client that, they, that there are these different options and that they advise that, that this option be taken and get the instructions from the client, therefore, to take that. And at least get some buy-in from the client um, into that course because um, it, it, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's important to keep clients informed about that sort of thing. Um, got five minutes left and I think this might be the last one. Um, offers of compromise. Um, often claims will arise in offers of compromise. Um, failing to make an offer. Obviously, it's important if your client instructs you to make an offer, it's important to actually carry out those instructions. Um, it's important to advise the client of the opportunity to make an offer um, and the, the, the reasons why you'd make an offer. Um, settle the proceedings early, you know, avoid all of the angst of the proceedings and the costs and the strategic reason why you'd make an offer. Because if we make the offer and the other side don't accept it, it becomes more powerful later on, uh, on relation, in relation to costs. So always at least consider the offer and, 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 and have the conversation with your client about making an offer. And if your client says, no, I'm not making any offers, I, this is a matter of principle, I want to run it all the way to judgment, then make sure you document that because that'll be useful if, if a claim later arises. Um, uh, obviously, in offers of compromise, claims can also arise if, if, if an offer isn't accepted and y y your client then turns out with a a worse outcome. Um, it's very easy for the client to look back and say, oh gee, you know, six months ago I had this on the table, it would have been nice to accept that instead of being in this position. 
Um, and they, we do get claims arising because clients say, look, I was given inadequate advice. If I had have been told X, Y and Z, I would have accepted this offer. Um, and, in, and particularly, if you get an offer, uh, an offer of compromise, it's important to advise the client of what the effects of that offer can be if it's not accepted in terms of costs. Um, because that's, that's a kind of a, 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 an easy uh, claim for a client to make is I was never told of these cost consequences. If I had have been told, I would have accepted this offer. A and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one because you've actually got, often with an offer, you've got a specific amount. You've got, you've got the eventual outcome so you can see the, the, the differences. Um, and the other area is, is if you're doing offers, if you're doing offers of compromise, be, be aware of the rules. Um, there are specific rules in relation to offers. Um, and so in, uh, often what will happen is if an offer is made, a, a formal offer of compromise is made, uh, it's not accepted, uh, the, the trial goes on and then the party who's made the offer wants to use the offer on costs, then obviously the other side have a great deal of interest in trying to pick holes in that offer and saying it's defective. Uh, and and we'll, you often see that in, in litigation. Um, and we have in fact had uh, I think it's a, it was a notification, uh, I don't think it resulted in a claim, a arising out of that where the firm said, oh, look, gee, we, there are issues here. Um, maybe this offer will be held to be defective and, and therefore the strategic value of that offer will be lost. Um, so, so that's the thing to be aware of when you're drafting offers. Make sure you comply with the rules. Make sure, they're, um, make sure you're clear on, on the consequences of what will, uh, will happen if it's accepted, therefore it's... It's, it's capable of acceptance um, and, and, um, and, and make sure it's clear it'll be able to be used in that you'll be able to compare the positions that the client would have, or the, sort of the offeree would have been in if they had have accepted it with the eventual outcome. If, if, if you know what I mean, hopefully you know what I mean. Um, inadequate preparation of trial. We often get these allegations in claims. Um, I don't know that they necessarily um, result in um, in, in judgments or settlements, but it, we often get that, so make sure you adequately prepare for trial. And unfortunately, um, solicitors do, and I know I'm speaking to a mixed audience, so I might get apples thrown at me or something, um, solicitors do tend to take the cop for barristers, um, often. Uh, so um, be aware of that. I mean, it's um, often it's, you know, a potential claim against both, um, but, but solicitors tend to be the first point of call for a client who is dissatisfied with the outcome. Um, so if you are briefing counsel, be aware as a solicitor, um, you still are liable. Um, you, you can't just rely upon the defence, oh, it's all, you know, I, I brief counsel. Um, solicitors do have a, a, an obligation to review counsel's advice and, and at least um, provide a filter there. Uh, no, I've... I know this is... I'll just quickly run through. Settlements are very important. Obviously, we get a lot of claims arising out of settlements, uh, inappropriate terms, uh, releases. They might be too wide, they might be too narrow. Um, settlement without authority. Um, waiver and disclosure of legal professional privilege does arise. Um, termination of retainer, we often get claims arising from that. And the question, key question there will be whether adequate notice was given in the termination of retainer. So be aware, if, you, if you're coming up for trial, and you want to terminate the retainer because you haven't got fees or something, at least give the client adequate notice um, so that it can't be said later on that the client, you know, was prejudiced by that termination. Um, cost disputes, we, uh, there's a whole heap of claims and notifications arising out of cost disputes where uh, a, 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 an allegation of negligence is made um, really as a, a strategic move by the client in relation, e either in reaction to a a claim for costs or even as a, a preemptive move to avoid having to pay costs. So um, be clear on your costs, have your costs agreements in place, um, inform the client about costs um, and, and really uh, important, um, take some independent advice before you issue proceedings um, seeking costs. It's a very technical area, there's, there's different avenues through the, through the, the costs court, through a through VCAT, through Magistrates Court, through the Legal Services Commissioner. It's a very technical area. If you, if you mess it up, if you haven't got your disclosure right, you can get into real trouble. 
So, so I, I really encourage you to get independent advice before issuing any sort of proce recovery proceedings, cost proceedings. Um, and then the last one, adverse cost orders, and I think this one will has has increased over the last few years, and I I fear that it may increase even further. We've got you know the, the Civil Procedure Act, um, we've got the new federal court uh, rules or the new federal court um, pre-litigation um, requirements. Um, uh, which important for everyone to be aware of and to comply with. Uh, I think New South Wales um, has pre-litigation requirements in all of the courts up there apart from the Supreme Court. Um, it is a growing trend that, that courts will require practitioners to um, take more responsibility, if you like, for the conduct of proceedings and it may well lead to further adverse costs orders against practitioners when they haven't done that. Um, so that I'm out of time. Um, thank you for listening and, and as I say, I encourage you to have a look at the LPLC website for further material.